Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Native American Foodways and Farming. I'm Lorraine Moffa, Programming Coordinator at Loudoun County Public Library, and it's our pleasure to host today's program and introduce presenter Clay Morris. Clay is a restoration ecologist with an interest in ethnogastronomy and food culture. He studies how food is a commonality between cultures, and a lot of his work is in effort to retain indigenous methods of foraging, cultivating, and gathering food. Welcome, Clay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me and taking part in this presentation. As Lorraine pointed out, um, by day, I am a restoration ecologist. I'm a botanist by training. Uh, on the sideline, though, I'm a forager, a gardener, and I am the consummate foodie. I really do enjoy food. So being able to combine both botany and food is, is really um, a good thing for me. Uh, side interest in ethnobotany, ethnoecology, and ethnogastronomy. Ethnogastronomy is kind of an emerging field, and it is, uh, we're realizing that food, food culture is a very important field for study. And um, so a lot of my work is in that regard. The reason I study food is because um, food culture is that one great commonality. If I sit down with you, even if we don't speak the same language, if I sit down to a plate of your food, I'm gonna understand something about you. And I really think the reason is that is because food is invariably made with love. So it is a great way to really kind of measure and understand uh, a, a people. I work within three contexts, all because either of heritage or location. Uh, I teach within the Native American, Appalachian, and sort of the Southern and Black cultures. Uh, this particular area, that's all very appropriate. So a lot of this conversation today is going to feel very local because um, you know, we are kind of in the crux of all three of these uh, cultural norms. So we're learning about Native Americans. Uh, Natives love stories, and I'm particularly interested in creation stories or cosmology stories because I think they really give us a glimpse into how people think about themselves, how they came into being, um, what was intended for them as a species or as a people. So one of the most beautiful ones is the Sky Woman creation story. This is very popular in amongst woodland peoples, particularly northern woodland um, tribes. So the story of Sky Woman is at one time, the land was separated from the water and it was called the Sky Realm and then the Water Realm. Now, in the Sky Realm, there was this old sky god and he was fortunate enough to marry this young, beautiful lady, and um, but she was a bit of a chatterbox, uh, very curious, she talked a lot, she was always kind of getting in trouble. So we see here in this picture, there's a tree toppled over. Well, the reason that tree got toppled over was because Sky Woman was very curious and there was this glow coming around the tree. So she put her hands on the tree to see where this glow, this glow was coming from, well, the tree toppled over and there was a huge hole in the sky down to the water room. Well, the old sky god saw his opportunity and he basically just kind of booted her down through that hole. So the next picture we see her falling down toward the water. Well, upon the water and in the water were all the creatures that live within the water. So there were these geese that were floating there in the water. They look up, they see the shaft of light, they see this beautiful woman falling down. So as geese will do, they look upon each other and they fly up and they gather her in her wings and they slowly bring her down to the water. But she's sitting there and they realize, well, they can't just hang out on, on goose wings all day. So the turtle comes along and said, turtle says, well, put her upon my back. So she climbs upon turtle's back and she's hanging out there, but turtle's back is kind of hard and tough. So some of the creatures that live within the water, like muskrat and beaver and otter, say, well, you know, I heard at the bottom of the water, there's this very soft mud. Well, beaver says, well, I'm going to swim down and I'll bring up some mud. So he swims down. He's gone a long time. He comes back up and he's like, I, the water's too, the, this, I can't get there. The water's too deep. I couldn't get to the mud. Well, otter says, well, let me try. So otter swims down. He's gone even longer comes back up and he's like, no, I, I just, I can't make it. So finally, little muskrat says, well, let me try. And everybody kind of looks as, you know, scans because little muskrat's kind of awful small little guy and they don't think he can do it. But anyway, off he goes and he's go gone a very, very long time. 
Then after a while, some bubbles just kind of pop to the surface and the other animals look at each other and they kind of drop their heads because they know that little muskrat didn't make it and that he's died. But after a while, little muskrat's body comes to the top of the surface and in his little paws, he's holding these handfuls of mud. So they take this mud, this mud and they put it upon turtle's back and turtle and the sky woman spreads this mud over the back of the turtle and it grows and grows and grows and becomes very soft. Now, when Sky Woman fell through that hole, she kind of was grabbing at things, trying to hold on. So she had all these plants and all these seeds and things in her hands. She, she, she sowed those seeds upon the mud on Turtle's back. And according to Native peoples, this was the beginning of what they call Turtle Island. And the reason you ever hear the term Turtle Island, you see on the other side that it's basically North America. That was their understanding that all of North America was upon the back of a turtle. Now, Sky Woman was a beautiful woman, and oftentimes she's uh, depicted as this very benevolent goddess, and she's often shown with uh, presenting like an apple or some food in her, your, her hands, and she's offering it to you because Native peoples viewed nature as a very giving and benevolent thing. Now, as I mentioned, um, cosmology stories are really important because they kind of give us a glimmer and an idea of how people viewed uh, creation. So let's contrast that with another creation story. Now, whereas Sky Woman is often presenting an apple, eating an apple didn't work out so well for Eve. For in Genesis, we're told, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten of the tree, saying thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy lives, thorns also and thistles, shall it bring forth to eat, and you shall eat the herb of the field, the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Now, whereas the sky woman was very benevolent with her food in the, the Old Testament version, um, you know, it's a much bleaker view. So I'm gonna put forth a couple of premises today. Um, premise number one, and we, you know, we have to admit there's some real ecological crises going on right now. And I think a lot of it kind of has to do with the way that we feel we can treat the earth. Western cultural, religious, and philosophical beliefs and attitudes toward nature have resulted in some of the current ecological crises. I think that's hard to argue that that isn't true. Uh, if we look again into Genesis and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and every other living thing that moves on the earth. And we see this kind of thinking really kind of emerge in the 18th century and 19th century, this idea of something called manifest destiny. And it kind of comes out of the Renaissance and the age of enlightenment and the industrial revolution where um, Europeans, Western inclined people really start believing that, you know, they, they know it all because they're able to, to manage it at such a scale. On the right is a famous picture interestingly enough, called American Progress. This is a painting done in 1872. In the middle of it, that glowing figure is a, a symbol that kind of predated the Statue of Liberty. Her name is Columbia. In her right hand, you see she's holding a library book. In her left hand, she is bringing telegraph wire. From the east, brightness and light into the west as the, with the western expansion, you can see the darkness before Columbia plea, flees the uh, ignorant Indians as they were seen, and the buffalo, and behind them comes progress like plows. Even the animals are fleeing before, before from this onslaught. But then this was kind of the impression, um, the belief that they were going to come and tame these wild lands. Now let's contrast that with how indigenous people think about it. Chief Seattle, one of the greats, the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. So again, a very strong contrast between this notion that people can do whatever they want with the land as opposed to the natives who felt that you had to really kind of take care of it. So again, there are truly some environmental crises, um, and so that requires some really kind of new ways of thinking, or maybe a return to the old ways of thinking. One of the fields, emerging fields in ecology is called traditional ecological knowledge. And the idea of this is basically to engage with indigenous people, to really learn from them and listen to them, 
really understand the way, you know, people that have, if you've been in a place for over 3,000 years, you probably know something about that space. And it's a good idea to kind of engage with these people. It's also a, a, a way that doesn't typically work with the scientific method because we are talking about three, you know, thousands of years of history and knowledge that oftentimes isn't available to sort of the Western scientific model. But, um, you know, we really should be talking to our native peoples and understanding what they know. There's another really famous book out there right now called Fickert Burke's Sacred Ecology and the same idea where in TEK is a cumulative body of knowledge, practice and belief evolved by adaptive processes and handed down through generations by cultural transmission with the relationship of living things, including humans, with one another and with the environment. Now, the real challenge, though, for Western science is this word or this idea of relationship. So premise two is by adopting a lot of these traditional ecological knowledge uh, fields um, and, and technologies and methods, we can translate them into Western ways of thinking, uh, particularly in the field of conservation biology and ecology. Uh, I'm very interested in food systems. So you see in the graph, uh, TEK, they do have their own version of folk systematics is which how they classify things. Uh, they have population level knowledge. Again, if you've lived in some place for thousands of years, you understand the ebb and tide of, of populations, fisheries, wild game. And then there's also the understand the ecological relationships. They know that everything is tied in together and that you have to maintain that balance. And then it translates well into Western scientific fields such as systematics, phylogenetics, biogeography. Uh, behavioral ecology, population genetics, community biology, ecosystem management, and uh, they all feed into really a much better understanding of sort of conservation biology. You can use this knowledge um, personal on a personal level, a communal level, or a regional level. A lot of the work that I do is within those three realms because I believe by understanding and recreating these methods, um, that we can start helping ourselves out of some of the messes that we're in. So we're here today to talk about native tribes and um, tribes are often divided into very large groups. And you'll see um, that little circle is kind of the region that we're currently in. This is um, in the tip of West Virginia, Virginia, bits of Maryland, and it straddles two large uh, native groups, the Northeast indigenous tribes and the Southeast indigenous tribes. So we have a bit of a blend going on, particularly if Loudoun County, we're right in the crux to the two. And so this is all part of the Eastern Woodland Assemblage. And it basically stretches from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico, and then from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. So all the peoples within that are often called the Eastern Woodland Tribes. Northeast to Southeast, 49 different tribes, numerous languages. Now, of course, they all started out at hunters and gatherers, but we're going to learn a little bit later about a really remarkable anthropological uh, discovery called the Eastern Agricultural Complex, but we're going to get to that a little bit. So, first contact Native, Amer um, Native American anthropology is kind of tricky, and by first contact, I mean those tribes that when the settlers first got here to the, you know, the early 1600s, well into about the 1850s, Anthropology was kind of a tough field because basically the settlers really didn't have any interest in these people. They were interested in what they knew, but they really had no interest in really kind of recording their knowledge and, um, and what they really knew. So the picture of the map on the right, that X is about the location of Harper's Ferry, Shepherdstown area. And if you look further down, there's another X. And the reason I put that is that's the location of the uh, Pamunkey Reservation. The Pamunkey Nation has a reservation down in King William County. Uh, the Pamunkey were a member of the Powhatan Confederacy. Now, it consisted of about 30 different tribes within the Powhatan Confederacy. But something really telling, one of the first books was John Clayton's 1687 account of the medical practices of the Virginia Indians. Now, I mentioned 30 different tribes but at no point did he say what tribe did what. Basically, he just called them savages. And this is kind of the conventional thinking for almost 200 years of our history. So unfortunately, the anthropology of that period, um, it's very difficult to know 
what tribes did, who they did, you know, how, how they lived their lives. It's very difficult to, to have an understanding of that. It got a little bit better with George Catlin. He was a famous artist. He moved out West and with the Western expansion and was much more cognizant and caring about the people and really did a good job of recording them and noting their names. And, you know, that long comes uh, Thomas Kenny's book and James Hall, probably one of the most comprehensive that comes out in 1865, the history of Indian tribes of North America. But if you really read into it, particularly toward the end, there's still this very strong bias against native peoples. Because they say ours is an economical age when nothing is valued that is not useful or practical. Wonder who they're talking about. We cannot consign a vast region to eternal sterility and to support a multitude of human beings in idleness, ignorance, intemperance, and bloodshed. The view was that these native peoples were idle, ignorant, intemperate, and prone to bloodshed. So something had to be done about it. And we have a whole long history of how that worked out, unfortunately, for Native people. So one interest area that I'm really particularly focused on, and again, kind of the area that we're in makes sense. We're at the foothills of Appalachia. So Appalachia covers 13 states, 423 counties, 206,000 square miles. It's also one of the most biodiverse regions in the world, which is interesting for me, both as an ecologist and also uh, into food culture. You have numerous populations um, of people that moved into the area, Native American, Irish, English, Scottish, German, Polish, and African. With them, they bought their food traditions. One of the most fascinating things about Appalachian food, food ways, is just kind of the simplicity, creativity, and economy that they had with their food systems. It was necessary. It was born of want and need and resiliency, but it's still a very strong food culture. And again, something I'm really interested in. Of course, they had hunting. Uh, they did generational seed sharing. They had foraging traditions were very common throughout almost all of Appalachia. So let's talk about foraging. And, you know, we always have. There's 4,000 edible plants in the U.S. alone. I really think we should continue. Uh, there's numerous reasons why we should rewild our diet. For instance, we know that the intestinal microbiome, the, the bacteria and the different microbes that are in our digestive system do a lot to kind of really shape the way we feel, our health, our mental abilities. Um, there's been a, a tremendous amount of work done and just kind of showing that the more um, diverse your microbiome, the healthier you're going to be. They, there's a group of um, foraging a society uh, called the Dogon tribe in Africa, been studied extensively, lived very much a foraging lifestyle. And when they look at their microbiome, it's five times more complex than the Western diet. And guess what they don't have? Hypertension, heart disease, cancer. So again, there's a lot to be said about really kind of increasing that microbiome Food security, we all lost our minds when COVID came along. Where's all the food? There's no food. And there was no food on, on the shelves. But if we learn and we look around it, there's a tremendous amount of food out there that's available and accessible and very healthy for us. Uh, let's broaden our palate. The reason I really enjoy food, uh, forage food, is I like giving it to chefs. I take these ingredients to chefs and I like to see them incorporate that into the kind of the modern culinary cuisine. And just from a personal level, kind of this reconnection with nature, history, culture, it's a lot of fun to do a lot of foraging. Now, as I mentioned, you know, foraging is not just for natives. It is pretty wild, you know, widespread around the world. Um, Japanese have a word called sansai, which means being good to eat. The Greeks, you know, horta, horta culture, familiar plants that are eaten. These are plants that as they start coming up, people are familiar with them. They go out and gather them. Of course, the Italians have beautiful words for it, piante spontanee and erbe salvice, which basically means spontaneous plants. These were just little plants that would pop up in the springtime, and you would go out and eat them to kind of um, supplement your diet. Latin Americans, uh, Latins have a word called calites. So again, very widespread cultural um, traditions. So foraging in Appalachia, um, the reason I like both foraging and Appalachia is because there's a tremendous amount of to be done. There's 345 edible species in 77 different families. Uh, mustards, oaks, roses, and lilies are some of the largest. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the reason that um, 
foraging was so important, particularly for Appalachian prior to refrigeration and grocery stores, was you lived on a subsistence diet. Everything you ate was dragged, smoked, cured, or pickled. So come springtime, uh, you're out collecting the greens. Um, I come from a maternal side, an English household, so if it was green and bitter, it was really good for you. Summertime is the time of fruits and vegetables, numerous berry bushes, blackberries, raspberries, mulberries. A lot of the uh, herbaceous plants are putting forth their fruits and, and their vegetables. And then the fall, uh, it's the nuts, roots, and tubers times because these were plants or these were foods that would uh, have would be a source of fat that would get you through the year, uh, get you through the winter. Tubers would keep in your cellar so you'd have a source of food. Some uh, particular ones we see there is chicory, uh, Cafe Du Monde, chicory coffee, wild mustards, very popular green, very packed full of different nutrients. A watercress is a wonderful um, addition to the food. On the bottom is pokeweed. Pokeweed's kind of fascinating because it is poisonous unless prepared properly. There's an old dish called poke salad, which was very popular. Uh, amongst Appalachians, and again, you really had to know how to prepare it or you could get quite sick. But the reason you ate it was because it was very nutritious, but you had to have it in the hands of a, a, a you know, a granny who knew how to prepare the stuff. <clears throat> Let's talk about a couple plants that natives would use. And, and a lot of what um, you're going to see tribes that have been referenced, and a lot of this is sort of for their medicinal uses for these plants. One of them is red cedar or um, juniper, uh, a plant very common that grows around here in the area. It's an evergreen tree. And it was an anthelmintic. Now, just as you had to deworm your cat and your dog, you also had to deworm your kids. Not something we have to think about much more, but um, in those days, that was, it was a common problem. Uh, Anti-rheumatic for rheumatism. It was a great cold remedy. Um, it was a cough, a great cough medicine uh, that was a use that was carried over by the settlers. Uh, if you're a gin drinker, you're going to recognize the flavor right away because it's the gin, it's the juniper berry that gives the flavoring to gin. Catnip. Actually, this is a very wild, widespread plant, very common weed in this area. You might not have ever encountered it, or you probably have and didn't really know really what you're looking at. And between the Cherokee and the Iroquois tribe, there was a tremendous number of different uses and uh, anthelmintic, anticonvulsive, cold remedy, cough medicine, dermatological febrifuge, that means for fevers, gastrointestinal, pediatric, sedative, stimulant, tonic, uh, the Iroquois, analgesic, antidiarrheal, anthelmintic, cold, cough, fever, gastrointestinal, laxative, oral aid, pediatric, sedative, and throat aid, numerous uses for this one particular plant. White pine, a very common pine tree in this area, probably maybe have some growing in your yard or you walk past some every day. The Iroquois really liked this plant and they used it a lot as an anti-rheumatic uh, blood medicine. That often means sort of a tonic or a purifier. Cold remedy, cough, dermatological aid for skin, dietary, emetic, uh, gastrointestinal, liver, orthopedic, pediatric, psychological, and pulmonary. Again, a lot of uses for some of these plants. And the thing is, is a lot of these uses were born over thousands of years of use. And, you know, oftentimes I think there really must be something to them. Uh, plantago, this is a very common weed in your yard. I hate that term weed, but, you know, that's kind of the vernacular that we like to use. Uh, amongst the Chiroquois and the, and the Iroquois, it was an analgesic. You'd make a poultice out of this. It still works really well for bee stings. Uh, Antidiarrheal, it's an antidote, burns, a dermatological aid for the eye, and even a snake bite. Now, here's a uh, common bone set, and this is a very beautiful, widespread plant. Um, uh, the Iroquois use it extensively. Uh, it's an analgesic, cold remedy, dermatological aid, febrifuge, gastrointestinal, hemorrhoid, kidney, laxative, orthopedic. Interesting word, uh, for, particularly for the um, orthopedic. The it was good to it's supposed to be good for broken bones and AKA that's where the word bone set came from. Uh, it could also be a poison. Uh, it was good for psychological, particularly if you had a drinking issue, pulmonary and also veterinary uses. So that was just some of the common plants that were often used as a medicinal. 
Now let's really dive into sort of native farming. And I had mentioned one of the really unique things about the Eastern Woodland tribes and something to be um, kind of proud about or just recognize this happened in, you know, in this region was when we really looked at sort of the archeological studies, and this is basically how we know how people did things is we look on their trash pits. Where did they discard their food scraps? And um, we noticed that there was a concentration of certain seeds, not a widespread, but there's sort of a concentration of these particular speed, seeds that basically, because there was uh, so many of them told us that these foods were popular foods. So about 7,000 years ago, one of the seeds that starts popping up is a plant called Cucurbita pepo, subspecies ovifera. And you're going to know this mostly as it was a kind of gourd or um, in time would be the source for squashes and pumpkins, but, but typically it was a bottleneck gourd. Now, people were eating the seeds. Now, we typically think about these plants and eating the flesh and discarding the seeds, but about 7,000 years ago, they were much more interested in the seeds. But then we see over time that the, there was a selective breeding going on by the natives and so that the flesh was becoming much more important. And then you start seeing uh, the squashes and the pumpkins being developed. The reason these plants were really so important was they had a wide range of climatic adapt adap uh, adaptability. So squashes that would grow well in Florida would not grow well in New York, but given time, they were able to create varieties that sur could survive throughout this area, and they were also a very, a very uh, reliable food source. We also see that there was a dramatic increase in fruit size. So that tells us that native peoples were experimenting and trying and selectively breeding this wild uh, fruit that they found into basically a very common source of food for them now. Now, we also see within those trash piles is some uh, six different plants. Uh, May grass and little barley were our grass seeds, and um, but they were eating the seeds from these grasses. Uh, there's goosefoot, which is a Kenopodium berlandia. That is basically the uh, quinoa. We have a version around here called lamb's quarters, which is very closely related. They were eating both the greens and the seeds from that plant. Uh, erect knotweed, a very common plant, uh, particularly growing around wet areas. So they're eating the seeds from that sunflowers. Yes, natives gave us sunflowers. Another plant that you won't find around here is a plant called sump weed, but they were eating most of these plants for their seeds because seeds are a great source of nutrition and fat. The lifestyle you lived was very, it was very busy, very hard. So you always had to have a source of fat. Maybe you weren't a good hunter. So anyway, you always had to have good sources of fat and protein. Now, the big story is after a while, so, you know, people were growing those six weeds. They were, um, they weren't tilling and making rows for them, but they were coming across areas, particularly on riverine systems in different areas. And they were intentionally putting those seeds out and growing these plants because it was a source of food. So we call that incipient agriculture. And then along comes corn and beans. So about 10,000 to 8,500 years ago, in Mesoamerica, there was sort of the selective plant breeding of that plant on your right, and that is a grass called teosinte, and it is just a grass. But there was a selective breeding going on. You can see those little seeds was the thing that they were most interested in. So selective breeding, the goal was to get more of those seeds, to get them bigger and um, more nutritious. They made it to the Eastern Woodland region but it took a long time. They didn't really show up until about 1200 to 800 years ago. And the reason was, is because Meso, uh, Eastern woodland is a whole lot different than in Mesoamerica, uh, South Central America. So it had to take a lot of selective breeding to get those plants up to this area. You had to get over mountains, dramatically different climatic uh, ranges. So it was really necessary in a long, long time of selective breeding to get those plants here. Once corn did arise, though, it basically really kind of took over and you really start seeing this movement toward true um, agro, uh, ag agriculture where they are growing these plants in rows intentionally. This allows people then to kind of stay in one place to create villages. 
Now, growing up, we were all taught that basically the cradle of civilization was the Fertile Crescent somewhere over in the Tigris and Euphrates River in, in Iraq. Well, what we know is that these, these crop complexes are crop complexes when we were able to trace a group of people moving from a hunter-gatherer society to actually agriculture. And there are, we know of 10 major crop complexes in the world, and one of them happened right here in the foothills of Appalachia. A really remarkable testament to Native American people. So let's talk a little bit about native gardening. Natives did not have a concept of land ownership. It was totally alien to them. Now they would have areas that they would live and, but it, everything was group held, commonly held, this notion of this is mine and that is yours and never the twain will meet was, is, is not, just doesn't exist among native people. Now one of the things that they practiced was polyculture. And the idea of that is garden as nature does. Remember, it's all about relationships of certain plants get along with other plants and certain plants don't. And but if you grow the two together or you grow them all in a, in a, a grouping together, that they're going to benefit each other. This really kind of ties into this notion also of very popular classic ecological theory called the diversity hypothesis. And basically, the diversity hypothesis says that the more diverse your ecosystem is, or your garden, or your food system, the more resilient it's going to be. And that kind of makes sense. In, in ecology, if you have a lot of plants for a particular purpose, and one of those plants gets a disease or doesn't make it, you're gonna have other plants to replace it and fill in that function. Um, and it's a very strategic way of thinking. The, when the settlers arrived, they, they saw that the natives had cleared, you know, vast amount of, bits of land. The first thing I do want to dispel this notion that native people were wandering around getting lucky. No, they were managing the landscapes around here at a scale we cannot imagine. And the native the settlers would often say it was like Eden. Well, because native people were purposefully growing plants that were of use to them and benefit to them. It was a very strategic way of thinking of growing a lot of different plants and foods was going to be the thing that helped you survive catastrophe and calamity. Natives were very communal. They would grow their food together. They would work it together. They would store it together and they would eat together. And they had a gift economy. Their notion was is that all of this was for everybody and was to be shared equally. One of the ones that uh, for farming systems you might be familiar with is this idea of, in terms of polyculture, is the three sisters. And the reason that we do polyculture is because it's optimized space. This notion of having a row of something and then bare dirt and then another row of something does not make any sense because there are a lot of symbiotic relationships between plants that we should be taking advantage of. The most classic is the three sisters. And this is a combination of corns, beans, and squash. So the corn grows and it provides a trellis for the bean. The bean grows up the trellis. Now beans have this really unique ability in their root structure to do something called fixing nitrogen, nitrogen fixation, which is very vital for uh, the, all the other plants because they all need nitrogen. And then squash is kind of hanging out in the bottom and it's spreading. The, the leaves um, shade the soil, they keep it cool, they retain water. So you have these three plants all working together and benefiting each other and taking up uh, much less space than if you were to plant them individually. One of the fun things um, about native gardening was they would do planting by the moon. That's still very popular with a lot of settlers and Appalachians. There was something that they adapted. At first, it seems a little strange that you would uh, plant uh, something or do something in your garden based upon the phase of the moon, but there might be a lot of credence to this. So basically planting by the moon, going from the new moon when it's dark to the full moon, that's called waxing. And the, basically the moon is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And this is the time you would plant above ground crops. And then you go from the full moon down to the new moon. So that's called waning. And that's when the moon is getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And that's when you would do the below ground crops. So people would always kind of know the phase of the moon and they would kind of think about, okay, what time of, you know, what's going on, what's, what's the moon and when should I plant and what should I be doing? And this kind of makes sense and it has been borne out in, in studies that there is a lunar effect on water, just as the moon, the full moon affects tides, the moon is 
the full the tides are highest in the full moon and they're lowest in the new moon they've also been shown that there's a water column in soil soil holds water and there's a surface tension and so when the moon is high the water in the soil rises up to the top so that's a good time to plant above ground crops because you have available moisture and then the same thing then when the water drops that is a good time to the word the waning moon that's a good time to plant seeds because then that, that water column is available for these seeds so it's also very practical at first it sounds a little strange and a little odd but there is a lot of um a lot of science to it now settler gardening gardening was a lot different than native gardening and the reason was is because it was land ownership you were given your little patch of land and that was yours and that's all you had and therefore you had to make the best of it remember this whole notion of um well i'm going to say first thing though the picture on the left there that shows a settler garden and that sure looks like polyculture and i think the reason was is every square inch this was your little bit of this is what's going to get you through so every square inch of land you had you planted something i can see corn and squash and beans all kind of mixed in together and those settlers had kind of adopted the the native notion but we see over time that they um the the mood changes the methods change and they start really kind of clearing ground and plowing it because remember that was kind of what you were that was what had been um thrust upon you because of eve uh, the ground is cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to eat people looked at growing food it was going to be tough it was going to be onerous and um you know maybe these native methods are a better way to kind of think about how we grow food Settler garden was very family oriented. You're going to grow yours and for your family, and that was it. And also, kind of, this is private property. This was your property. This is what you had to get by, and, and good luck with that. Now, we have seen a loss of TEK. A number of things uh, kind of brought that on. Natives and Appalachian settlers really intermingled and intermixed, but slowly those relationships started to fray. In Appalachia, one of the things that, um, you know, the, the settlers adopted the native approaches to things, but then we start seeing that knowledge kind of go by the wayside. One of the reasons was coal. So most people living in Appalachia from 1600s to about the early 1800s were subsistence farmers. There was some coal farming on, going on, but basically coal was only used in forges. It was after the Civil War that coal became really important because then they really started needing a lot of iron for weapons and plows. And so you sort of see this burning industrialization, steel really becomes an important um, uh, business and economy. Then you have these urban capitalists in Boston and Washington and, and big cities that are investing in these coal factories. And unfortunately, it's almost a kind of domestic colonialism because basically there was a natural resources and there was cheap, cheap human labor. And so these settlers that had been scrapping by and trying to get by suddenly had a source of steady income and, and, and money and work. It required them to leave their land. So you see farmers becoming miners and having to leave their, their old ways. And a loss, and along with that is a loss of sort of that, a lot of that knowledge, ways that they had learned from the natives, ways that they had adapted to themselves. So there was this considerable loss of these old farming and traditional food methods. It was replaced by the mining towns and the stores. By the time the 20th century gets here, you know, they really, this, the, the stereotypes start coming up. There's the marginalization of these regions. So not only have these people lost a lot of the knowledge, but then they're also kind of stuck in this economic uh, hinterland, which is really unfortunate and still kind of is playing itself out in Appalachia. So the whole point of this is in, in celebration of native people is to recognize how ingenious they were and a lot of their techniques and methods, I think bear um, revisiting and readaption. Um, 
again, that whole notion in, in sacred ecology, a cumulative body of knowledge, practice and belief evolving by adaptive processes. This is not stuff that's stuck in, in time. These are adaptive processes. We can learn and modify these methods. They're handed down from generation by cultural transmission. And it's all about that relationship of living things, humans with one another and with their environment. So there's a lot of work out there right now in intellectual recovery projects, uh, something I'm particularly interested in. And the reason that we should do this is because we can pull this over into so many different fields of studies by really looking back and understanding how people did things and bringing it forward is going to help us through a lot of crises because they got through them. Um, there's currently permaculture that works for both your home and your landscape. Um, look up food forest. That's a wonderful concept that's becoming very popular. Uh, regenerative agriculture. This is, we really need to rethink the dominant agricultural model. This notion of monocultures of fields of corn and fields of wheat is not serving us well because of what it takes to maintain those monocultures. Regional foods and food cultures locally produced. If we really want the farms to stay around here, then we really need to support our local farmers and our local producers. They're doing what they can to keep farmland intact. We, if we want a secure food source, need to support them to make sure that those foods are available to us. Oral documentary, a lot of the work that I and my students are going to do are going to be out there talking to the people doing this work, recording their stories, and really kind of keeping track of both what was done and what direction we're going. Root work, and this is, uh, they're finding that this approach to conservation is also very useful for rare and endangered plant species conservation. If you give people sort of these cultural, these food cultural touchstones, then they're gonna do a really good job of, of keeping, um, keeping them protected uh, conjure feminism, uh, women's studies. You know, what did the old, what did the granny ladies and the medicine women, what did they know? They knew a lot. They kept their people alive. And so I think that's also a really good field uh, of, of study for us to keep and retain. So finally, uh, we do need to develop a multiple worldview. We've got to kind of move away from this Western notion that we can fix it with um, with a machine or with a, 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 pr a spray or a powder or something, we really need to kind of rethink how we're managing our landscape. Uh, traditional ecological is not just for natives. We've all been here long enough now. We all face these same crises. So let's take advantage and understand this knowledge that the native people had. And we also have to include humans as an integral part in restoration efforts. So much of restoration ecology is done for what I call the bugs and the bunnies. But we also need to realize that we need to be bringing things into those restoration and efforts that are beneficial to humans, that we are part of the cycle and we need to um, think about it and be part of it. Um, I provided my email below if you're interested and you want to reach out to me. I do teach um, foraging classes. Also, I am going to be teaching for the spring 2024 semester, an Appalachian Foodways and Foraging course at Shepherd University. It will be a month, it will be a, a semester long um, study. You are welcome to take uh, Shepherd University classes. You do not have to be a student there. If you're interested in that course, it's Appalachian Foodways and Foraging. Uh, reach out to me and I'll put you in contact with people that can sign you up to take part in that class.